Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which has been in virtual mode since the beginning of the lockdown, looking at the same sorts of issues as we were looking at in the real world. This is an opportunity for us to uh, to tackle something which is really, really important. It comes from uh, a, an article, a column written by Patrick Jenkins in the Financial Times about the perceived tension between crisis measures to ensure financial stability and the investability of banks. And this is a fundamental problem going forward if indeed we ever do get out of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. I'm delighted that we have three Enormously eminent speakers. Kickoff speaker is Alex Brazier, who is the Executive Director for Financial Stability Strategy and Risk at the Bank of England and a member of the Financial Policy Committee. He's a former principal uh, private secretary to the governor, a manager of the bank's forecasting team, um, educated at Cambridge and Warwick and all sorts of other places, uh, but he doesn't get everything or his own way. Um, Next to speak is Simon Samuels, the founder of Veritum Partners, a former managing director at Barclays Investment Bank and at, at City as well. Um, before that, I note a director at Kleinwalk Benson, and he began as a chartered accountant. Good almighty, he's done, done good. Uh, and then batting cleanup, John Cronin from uh, uh, Financials Analyst, a good body in Dublin. Um, he's been with Good Boris for four years, he, before that with Investec Ireland, and before that with the National Treasury Management Authority. And we may well find that that's a, a precedent that has interesting ramifications in the, the UK. But uh, I'm going to start with my colleague, Jane Fuller, because Jane has done quite a lot of work in this area. Jane is a former financial editor of the FT, uh, and she has been, as it were, coordinating the speakers for this. So, Jane, what do you hope to get out of this? Well, I'm hoping to hear um, a, a, a good debate on the proposition that the action of uh, central banks in general, and we're obviously looking at the Bank of England, UK banks in this case, that central bank action has uh, been bad news for the investability of banks. And uh, the sort of evidence for this would be a poor share price performance by the banks this year, uh, their low uh, price to book valuations, and um, people point to things like um, the ban on dividends, um, and also things like the uh, very, very, very low uh, base rate that's uh, uh, said to have a, an impact on net interest margins. So uh, that's what I'm hoping to hear, a good uh, discussion of th those sorts of uh, tensions. On many of those issues, I got a, 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 an email this morning, as perhaps many of you who are watching this did, from Tim Congdon, uh, who was making many of those points very, very forcibly. Uh, but can I give you, first of all, Alex Brazier. Alex, your thoughts. Uh, thanks, Andrew, uh, and thanks, Jane. Um, thanks for organising this. These are, um, these are big questions, as you say. But uh, I'd like to start maybe by drawing a contrast between um, two measures of performance or fitness of the, of the British banking system. So on one hand, it looks really in very good shape. It's actually helped the economy to bridge a very severe period of economic disruption, starting with meeting a drawdown of around about 30 billion on revolving credit lines in, in mid-March through to maintaining its existing supply of credit to companies, which, you know, look back to 2007, it could have deleveraged that pretty quickly. Uh, and then thirdly, through primarily through government schemes, massively expanding the supply of credit to, to Britain's companies. So the banking system has played an absolutely vital role in helping the economy through this really difficult period, and in doing so, kind of preserving the productive capacity uh, of the economy for whatever comes next. But of course, as Jane said, you look on the other side, look at this other measure of fitness, primarily its equity valuation or price to book ratio, languishing at around about 40%, uh, and it looks decidedly unfit. So I think it's worth thinking about uh, three questions, really. One is, well, why is, it, why is the equity market valuing it like, like that? The second is, uh, what can central banks and regulators, if anything, do about that? Uh, and thirdly, perhaps most importantly, does it matter? Does being unfit in the eyes of the equity market actually uh, compromise your performance uh, in deliver continuing to deliver for the for the real economy? So on, on why and can we do anything about it? I think there are primarily three reasons. But before mentioning those, it's important, I think, to understand one thing that I don't think it, it does reflect. 
So low price to book valuations do not, I think, currently reflect the equity market thinking that banks are just sat on a whole load of unbooked credit and market losses. This isn't the market saying, actually, the banks have less capital than their book, uh, than their book value implies. Uh, banks have provisioned about 20 billion of losses over recent quarters. Analyst expectations are that they might provision another 20 or so over the next year. So that really isn't a big part uh, in this. I think the three primary drivers for the equity market uh, valuation of banks are, are firstly that um, they didn't really value banks very highly before COVID. So you look back to the past few years, banks price to book ratio was around about 80%. So it wasn't that they were assumed to be generating a return on equity equal to their cost of equity, uh, even back then. And primarily, I think that reflected things like conduct costs or conduct fines, meaning that UK banks had a cost to income ratio of around about 70% compared to their US peers at, at 60. So actually dealing with those underlying issues uh, was, was and still is pretty vital to banks in, in getting their, uh, sorting out their, their fitness in the eyes of the equity market. Now, some say we should have um, uh, loosened capital requirements, reduced capital requirements on banks. If only we'd done that, they'd have had a higher return on equity. Uh, it will not surprise anyone to hear me say that I think that would be completely mad. Uh, and that's for two reasons. Firstly, you know, had we gone into this with a banking system as weak as in 2007, we wouldn't just have a public health issue or a uh, economic issue. We'd have a banking crisis at the same time. So I don't make any apology for the amount of capital banks were uh, required to hold in the run up to this. And the second thing is, that, you know, reducing capital requirements would have been wholly ineffective in boosting equity valuations, because firstly, debt holders would have demanded a bigger slice of the pie, particularly bail-in debt holders for the extra risks they were taking. And secondly, the equity investors would have demanded a higher return as well for, for investing in a more levered institution. So, you know, actually, the issue there about long-run performance was more about cost control and managing conduct risk than it was about capital requirements. So that was the first thing, kind of pre-COVID performance. The second thing I think is obviously, as Jane alluded to, the what's happened to the yield curve since March. Short rates have come down um, by 70 basis points or so. And at the same time, the long end of the yield curve has fallen as well. So there's been no steepening. That's a perfect storm for banks. And having miraculously kind of maintained their loan margins for the past 10 years or so, uh, finally, net interest margin has been has been squeezed, and that's going to squeeze banks' returns, and the equity market is is reflecting that. Now, as a central bank, of course, you know you could reach for the interest rate lever and say, right, we're going to sort this out, we're going to raise interest rates. But actually, you know, obviously, it's completely mad to tighten monetary monetary policy on the basis of uh, bank equity valuations. Actually, banks need to adjust their business models and their cost bases to live with. An environment of lower interest rates uh, for even longer. So that's the second reason. The third reason, I think, is that banks' cost of equity has risen since March, no doubt about it. Uh, and in one level, that's not surprising at all, because given the geopolitical uncertainties and the economic uncertainties here and overseas, you know, there's a real risk for shareholders of taking further losses. Now, the good news for the economy is that the banks have big enough capital buffers, as we've shown in repeated stress tests, to deal with really quite severe economic scenarios. But if you're a shareholder, you're rightly the person taking the losses in those scenarios. So if you attach any weight to those sort of severe downside risks to the economy, and in a period of uncertainty, many investors do, then actually you'll demand to be compensated for that. And equity prices reflect that somewhat. And then, of course, the cost of equity has risen in part because of dividend restraint. Uh, it's important to remember why uh, banks did hold back dividends in March. You know, putting eight billion pounds out of the door at a time when uh, the outlook was so uncertain, the path of the virus was uncertain. We didn't know uh, what was happening with government support measures. We didn't know what was happening with public health measures. Putting eight billion out of the door at that point would have been uh, <laughs> brave, if to say the least. Now, I wouldn't overstate the impact of that dividend restraint on um, uh, on banks' equity performance, and that's because you know we're not asking here for banks to run with a higher level of capital in the long run. So this is a dividend delayed 
rather than a dividend destroyed forever. It doesn't change the amount of distributions banks will make over the long run. It does, of course, though, require a degree of patience for investors. And there are frictions in the market that mean that, you know, particularly for things like income funds, they're unable to invest in those sorts of stocks. So it is important to recognize that dividend restraint does have an impact on banks' cost of equity. Uh, now, it won't surprise you to hear that I'm not going to give any guidance on our stance on, uh, on dividends, uh, except to say perhaps what we've already said, which is um, we regard distributions as an important and necessary part of uh, the functioning of the banking system, and we'll undertake very careful analysis in the fourth quarter of banks' distribution uh, plans. And I'll finish then with the most important uh, I think, question, which is, do these equity valuations actually matter for banks' ability to continue to serve the real economy? Uh, and I think the short answer is not necessarily. Uh, it's not always a good guide. Look, before 2007, the equity market really valued banks quite highly, and they then went on to sideswipe the economy. Uh, banks are still investable. It's just the existing investors don't much like the price. And they still have buffers of capital to absorb very big very big losses in very bad economic situations. So it isn't really affecting their ability to, to lend. But there is, uh, I think, an important nuance, and I'll finish here, which is that um, banks need to be as comfortable as we are about drawing down their capital and letting their capital ratios deplete, drawing into their capital buffers, if and as they do take more losses. Um, and their comfort about dipping into those capital buffers is actually going to rely quite a lot on them being able to see the path to rebuild those buffers uh, after the period in which they're taking, taking losses. Um, and while they're weakly profitable and facing a high cost of equity, they might reasonably fear that path being steep. Uh, so it's important for us as regulators and central banks to take into account when we're thinking about you know, the speed with which capital buffers need to be rebuilt after this, we need to take into account banks' profitability and their ability to generate capital organically. And we've done that before, and we've, we're on record as doing so, and people should um, you know, believe our credibility that we'll continue to do that. Because, and I'll finish here, you know, our guiding principle with all of this is that um, whenever we're being prudent, to coin a phrase, it always has to have a purpose. And that purpose is you know, the service of the, the real economy. And so, you know, demanding banks rebuild capital buffers very quickly after this isn't consistent with helping them to continue to provide, to go back to where I started, the very valuable support they have, they have provided to the economy so far. And we hope they continue to be able to provide. I'll stop there. Well, I like uh, this idea of prudence with a purpose. But could I just ask you to expand a little bit about anticipated loan losses? I mean, the speed with which you draw down uh, capital buffers very much depends on uh, the outlook for loan losses. Yeah, and you know, on the central outlook, as I said, banks have provisioned about 20 billion, the major banks. The analyst expectation in the central view is for another 20 or so, uh, which isn't actually it's big by standards of the past 10 years, but it's well within banks' ability to withstand losses. You know, we've conducted stress test exercises to look at what sort of credit losses they could withstand if they had to. And that's of the order of £200 billion pounds worth of credit losses, so 10 times what they've already provisioned. And to generate those kind of losses, you need an economic scenario that is, you know, as we put in the financial stability report, at least a repeat of what happened in the second quarter, but with things that didn't happen then as well, like unemployment rocketing up at the same time. So you need very, very severe economic scenarios to really generate losses that would challenge banks' ability to lend. But, of course, if you're a shareholder or an investor, you're rightly the one who bears the consequence of those losses. And so that's why fearing outcomes, you know, downside risks to the economy and credit losses, investors demand a higher return uh, on their investment right now. OK, Simon, Simon Samuels, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, th thanks. Uh, um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to whoever is watching this at whatever time in, in your time zone you're watching this on the recording. Um, so I think that's, I think actually a lot of what Alex said there is really interesting. And actually, I want to pick up on a kind of a couple of reflections. One is generally about the relationship between regulators and investors, and then specifically on some of the comments that Alex made about, uh, uh, about some of the topics that he, he discussed. I mean, let me just start by saying, I think it's, 
certainly in my judgment, I think it's pretty clearly not within the regulator's wheelhouse to ensure that banks are investable. I, I think it's a byproduct of their actions rather than uh, should be a central part of what they're focusing on. And indeed, throughout my career in the industry, I've always been struck by how particularly equity investors always assume regulators care enormously about them. Yet the reality is, most of the time, appropriately, regulators are not so focused on, on equity investors. Um, the second observation I want to make, which might sound a slightly unusual one for somebody like me who comes from an equity market background, is I think it's not always obviously clear that the tougher the regulator is, the worse the outcome is for investors. Um, and indeed, there are good examples, have been good examples over time of banks operating in re regulatory regimes that I think most people consider very tough yet where stock market valuations of the banks operating in those environments has actually been at a premium to other geographies. And I've got in my mind the Nordic banking region generally following the early 90s property meltdown really for the last 20, 25 years, the Nordic banks have broadly been considered to be very toughly regulated yet have premium valuations. Absolutely is the same is true for the Swiss banks. And indeed, many might even argue the US banking system which on some measures, the regulatory environment, certainly around capital is tougher than it is in Europe, generally has higher valuations. I think it's not a given that a nasty regulator is bad news for investors. Um, I also think it's important before I sort of uh, get into some more specifics of what Alex said, I think it's also important to distinguish between central bank policies that are specifically targeted at banks um, versus those that are targeted at the wider economy which may damage banks, but through a kind of a collateral damage. So for example, low interest rates, payment holidays, government backed lending, using banks as conduits. Uh, all of these are first and foremost an, a, an economic response, which may or may not indirectly or directly impact banks, but clearly banks are not in the, the crosshairs for those. However, I think it's the areas where banks are being specifically targeted, where I think there is more discussion. And here I'd probably first of all agree with Alex, um, on the, the starting point he made, maybe the most important observation, which is the need for higher capital. I think clearly given what happened in 2008, 2009, I don't think anybody in his or her right mind would conclude that the result of that was the banking system had enough capital. So, so without a shadow of a doubt, it's entirely appropriate that regulators have required banks to hold capital levels that are multiples of where they were uh, going into 2008, uh, clearly all targeted as an effort to make sure taxpayers are not again, on the hook to bail out failing banks. Um, also, I think, uh, and maybe this might be something we pick up in a discussion, but I think logically, banks with higher capital ratios should actually enjoy lower cost of equities, yet that remain, lower cost of equity, yet that has remained extraordinarily elusive for the last 10, 15 years. Um, and, and I think it is worth exploring why that might be the case, uh, maybe a little bit later. Um, but with respect to capital, there's one thing that I remain uncertain about what Alex said that, that I think is, is, is a, I'd certainly think is worth reflecting on, which is the dynamics around the lowering of buffers. So Alex essentially presented uh, a, a, a regulatory environment where um, capital requirements can go up and can go down. And, and through the lowering of buffers uh, is the mechanics by which the banking system uh, can carry on providing credit to the real economy. Uh, in a way that's consistent with his regulatory environment. And, and, and that lowering of buffers effectively providing air cover to banks to maintain lending without having necessarily to raise more capital. I think it's important to remember uh, that in practice, regulators are not the only, and indeed, I might even argue, are not even necessarily the main setters of capital levels for the banking system. I'd say the capital markets themselves very quickly develop capital ratio norms that they in effect require banks to maintain, even in the face of regulatory forbearance. And that means in turn that often banks can have higher capital ratios that even if the regulator is allowing them to lower them, they've effectively become sticky, regardless of the changes in the underlying rule book that the regulator is applying. So, so I think often changes in regulatory requirements uh, from a bank's perspective and from an investor's perspective can often come over as a one-way street. They can go up very easily, but they're very, very sticky in a way to come back down again. The other area I want to push back on Alex's comments relate to the impact of the dividend ban, actually. Um, so I think personally, this has been the single most significant regulatory intervention, uh, not only during the pandemic, but arguably in the last uh, few years. 
Um, and I think it actually does run the risk of last, uh, l- longer lasting damage to the sector. And I think to understand why, I think it's important to understand the, the position of dividends. Firstly, I think the ban, I have to say, I think conceptually sits uneasily with other regulatory interventions, most obviously higher capital requirements and, in, and particularly in the UK, the ring fencing requirement. It, you know, arguably those, those provisions were put in place to allow a banking system to, uh, to deal with stress in a way that was that without damaging the wider economy. It seems to me uh, that, that, that it almost seems to suggest those other rule changes didn't go far enough and, it, and, and arguably undermines them. I think secondly, the reason I think it's so um, damaging is I think it gets us straight back to what I've certainly written about previously is the, the parent-child relationship between regulators and banks. That the, the, the regulators are the grown-ups and the banks are the children, and I think that was a uh, 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 that that kind of characterised the regulatory uh, bank relationship in let's say the five, six, seven years immediately after the 2008 financial crisis. I think the banking system was moving back towards more of a parent-parent relationship, and I think the dividend ban has taken us right back to where we were. But thirdly, and I think maybe most importantly. Dividends have come to gain an outsized significance for bank investors over the last uh, five or six years, and I think for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because share prices have been rubbish, and so they've been essentially become the only source of a sensible return. But I think secondly, more subtly, but more importantly, bank financial reporting has just become extraordinarily complicated, uh, almost impenetrable, uh, even to experts. The trust in the numbers presented by banks is on the floor. Uh, although I've been very heavily involved in some of the architecture around IFRS 9 reporting, the reality is IFRS 9 itself is a sufficiently complicated accounting standard that it can only do, that it can only further erode the trust and numbers that are being presented. And therefore, the dividend took on a role that was almost the only thing that people trusted. And particularly for those who are not so specialist in the sector, the general portfolio managers who've got the entire world of equities to invest in. To some extent, they could take a sit, step back and say, you know what, I don't really understand the gobbledygook that banks are presenting, but I do understand what a dividend means. And I do understand the concept of a dividend yield. And, and removing that, I think, has been enormously damaging. So I think, whilst overall, much of what Alex said, I definitely agree with. I do think there's areas where bank valuations have been very damaged by recent regulatory interventions. Okay, two points there. Would you, could you perhaps respond on them? Uh, the, the, the stickiness of, of capital buffers when they are, as it were, going down. And secondly, a little bit more on, on the dividend ban and particularly the points that Simon comes up with. Alex? Well, on the, um, on the buffers point, it's well taken that, the, as Simon says, the regulator isn't always the sort of marginal constraint on, on the banks. Um, often the debt investors and the, uh, and the equity investors will be too. I think, though, it's important that we, uh, and as many other people as we can enlist, kind of convey to investors that if banks actually, if they do t- end up taking losses and needing to deplete their capital buffers, that if they seek to defend against that by um, effectively cutting lending in a sort of 2008 style, that isn't, that isn't just that that's bad for the economy, that is actually bad for the lenders. Uh, as well. And we did some analysis in May looking at in this particular economic episode, when credit supply is perhaps even more vital than it is normally, the the kind of economic effect of of not lending or kind of going into a defensive crouch to try and defend your capital buffers isn't just kind of economically damaging. It actually results in much bigger losses on your existing loan books. And as a result, sees you deplete your capital buffer by even more. So, it's really important that we get across to all investors that um, that it's actually in their interests. Uh, and just because it's good for the economy doesn't mean it's bad for them uh, not to try and defend their capital buffers. It's a difficult story to tell. And it's a really kind of unusual message from a regulator to say, don't defend your capital position, keep lending, especially after 15 years of saying, you know, capital's on the way, on the way up. But I think that just reinforces the need to just keep repeating it over and over again. On the um, on the stickiness of cost of equity, that is a really interesting and important point that Simon raises. You know, it, it is certainly true that cost of equity was way too low before the crisis. Investors were not pricing in the risks they were, they turned out to be to be taking. But a cost of equity for banks that is in double digits even before this 
and um, you know, relative to a whole economy cost of equity of kind of six percent and a risk-free interest rate of below one, you have to question what it was that bank investors were were demanding. And actually, though, I think it links to Simon's other point, which I do think is really important about kind of trust and clarity, trust in and clarity of banks reporting. Now, if you're an investor and you don't pay you know, 24 seven attention to all these metrics, you, you'll just think, I just need a higher return to invest in this thing because there's more uncertainty about yeah. it. So whilst the last kind of 10, 15 years were about raising the standards of banks, I definitely think, you know, a period of kind of consolidation of the rules and also of the reporting would be very, very valuable, both the regulators, and I speak from some experience, uh, but also for the banks, and may actually have the, the consequence of um, lowering their cost of equity by clarifying their, their true position. So I, I think that stickiness of cost of equity, even though leverage is lowered, has something to do with what Simon's describing of just the sheer degree of complexity of, of reporting. And the other point on dividends in general, I mean, do you accept some of his other criticisms? Well, I, ex I accept that dividend restraint has raised the cost of equity for banks. It's interesting, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really dispute it, but it's interesting this point about the outsized importance of dividends. And, uh, you know, that says to me, we should sort out lots of the other things that mean dividends may have had outsized importance, one of which, as we've just discussed, is the kind of complexity uh, of reporting. But I do think it's important to remember that dividends or distributions are an important source of banks' resilience in stress. Now, when we've done stress tests in the past, banks have always said to us, yes, in a stress, we would reduce our, we would cut our dividends back. And that means we have a, you know, a mechanism by which we can absorb some of the losses. So we don't need as much capital as we would do otherwise. To which we've said, fine, that's very clear. But it means when a real stress comes along, dividends have to be restrained to some degree. Uh, you can't say one thing and then and then do another. It would be fine if you wanted to pretend you were a fixed income instrument if you said in a stress test, sure, I'm not going to cut my dividend and as a result, I need to have a bigger capital buffer. So there is a kind of degree of consistency we need to ensure here. But I, I do go back to this point that, you know, we have, or banks have actually, delayed a dividend. We are not demanding higher capital requirements in the long run. So it is a dividend delayed rather than a dividend destroyed uh, forever. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think this point about you know, dividends taking on outsized importance in, in the banking sector is something that is worth addressing uh, because we, we can't go on with them uh, actually being kind of the only, as Simon described, it's kind of only signal that anyone places any weight on. Okay, John, John Cronin. <laughs> Okay, thank you and good afternoon to everybody joining the call. Um, first of all, look, just it's difficult to disagree with any of the points made in relation to the progress made post GFC in terms of the uplift applied to capital requirements and the greater resilience of the sector, which arguably has been demonstrated significantly through, through this particular crisis. Um, similarly, in a policy context, you know, we have seen strong concerted action on the part of the Bank of England, particularly in a in a CCYB, SYRB, so so in terms of some capital relief measures there, as well as you know some more clarity around the calibration of Pillar Two A on a nominal basis, which was a sensible sensible change. Um, and I'll come to the I'll come to the, maybe the dividend inter, intervention, um, using that term loosely, uh, in a moment. But you know that's. The backdrop, I guess, to what we've seen as a sector that hasn't needed to resort to shareholders for more equity through a pretty turbulent period, and and you know lots of lots of help in that respect and protection in the event of further downside risk. But look, just to pick up on some of the more specific points raised by both Alex and Simon thus far, um, you know, I think the point in relation to valuations is particularly interesting. You know, I've regularly grappled with this view of life on cost of equity. Um, and the point that Alex made earlier about, you know, shareholders demanding a higher return or discounting a bank further to the extent that there was a greater level of leverage, it, it hasn't always worked out like that. And you know, it's at one level it's impossible to disaggregate what the what the average cost of equity that an investor is applying because it assumes that consensus expectations are right for any particular stock or sector as a whole. Um, Alex called out earlier the the average sell side consensus expectation. For UK banks, is for a further twenty billion of provisioning. 
Um, that seems a sensible, in, in broad brush terms, assessment at this point in time, but there are clearly downside risks. And I think what's being factored into bank valuations, among, among many, many other headwinds for the sector, is, is, is a risk that that number could be higher, and therefore a higher cost of equity is ascribed. So arguably one and, one and the same thing. Um, now, you know, in, in terms of the in terms of the importance of dividends, particularly, um, look, I think you know, I, I think it's difficult to understate it. You know, banks are typically you know the the, the marketing uh, strategy around pushing investors into banks at the moment is on 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 the basis of banks sitting. Uh, out there as deep value plays, which has been an incredibly difficult trade and incredibly difficult to stimulate interest among uh, shareholders in. And, you know, I think the, the, the yield is, is an essential component of total shareholder return and is, is, is really off-putting in terms of, you know, the, the, we, saw, we saw a big sell-off in the bank share prices in response to the, the letters issued by the PRA last March, which at one level, just in and of itself, illustrates the importance. But also, I think, in terms of, it's interlinked with the, the point made earlier by Alex around access to equity capital and do valuations really matter? I would, I would contend that they do. I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's this argument around banks dipping into capital buffers. And I think, you know, as Simon referenced, there is a, there is a, um, a market view on what the acceptable de minimis um, you know, capital, CET1 capital or total capital ratios ought to be and a bank will be discounted from a valuation perspective to the extent it falls beneath that number. Now, you know, should banks uh, be required to resort to shareholders, whether it be opportunistically, maybe in a consolidation context or to access more capital for good lending opportunities that would be ROE accretive, well, then valuations are incredibly important. And having the support of a stable, long-only shareholder base that is attracted by the dividend um, is, is essential in that respect. And I do think share register evolution is a, is a very important consideration in this context. You know, a lot of the conversations that I've been having in recent months with long-only generalist portfolio managers you know, are, you know, the points the points are well made around the struggle that generalists face in terms of understanding bank balance sheets and the complexities that lie within, and the you know a lot of the negative news flow is is just a function of the times in terms of in terms of rates in terms of you know the challenges in terms of getting costs down at the same pace in response to income headwinds, um, but but other 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 points also resonate you know. We're, we're, the degree of trust is breaking down. And I think, you know, asking, telling the banks or, 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 or being quite forceful with the banks in terms of dividend decisioning only further erodes the trust and the absolute strength of their capital bases. And, and, I, and I do believe on dividends particularly that, you know, it, 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 is, it is a point that it's very difficult to understate the importance of it. And I think allowing the banks, you know, be the decision maker in that context and, you know, trusting them to be responsible, not to erode capital <clears throat> to, to a highly significant degree in order to continue paying the dividend is, is, is something that needs to be debated. You know, I, I do accept, on the other hand, there is a temptation at the moment to please shareholders, especially given the, you know, selling pressure that banks have faced in this, in this, in this last six months. But notwithstanding that, you know, I think the, uh, there needs to be a sensible conversation around, you know, to, to what extent would banks, you know, in and of their own uh, decision making authority, uh, how, how far would they actually let C1 dip? And there are a lot of restraints around that in any event from a regulatory perspective. And <clears throat> perhaps some, some leave, you know, what, what I'm, I'd, li I'd like to maybe hear more of Alex's thoughts on the point around the, the, the dipping into the capital buffers, because it does seem to, you know, it does seem to, at one level, you know, be somewhat inconsistent with with the with the view earlier this year, where banks needed to protect their capital at all costs. Okay, that brings us straight back to dividends and capital buffers. That seems to be the uh, the main point of attack, as it were. Do you want to come in on on that, Alex, or? or Shall we open I thought Simon raised the hand. Yeah. Let him yeah. Do, do, do you mind if I, I just, if, if I could actually, I just, I, I wanted to, um, 
Well, well actually, on, on the issue of the cost of equity, and I think I, th I think part of the challenge here is I think we need to kind of decide what kind of banking system we want. So the part of the reason I think the cost of equity is stubbornly high is because it, it, in, in a sort of a crude sense, you could argue that banks have got the sort of the the return on equity upside of a very heavily constrained utility company, which is not very much. So their ROE peaks at a very modest level, but they have the uh, the, the cyclical characteristics of a deep and cyclical company. So when the economy blows up, banks profitability blows up. And actually, if you look at the history, and this is these are statistics for the UK banking system, but if you look at the UK banking system over the last 40, 50 years, even before uh, or, or I should say, excluding the, the 2008 financial crisis, the average return on equity decline in a recession was about 10 or 12 percentage points. So, you know, now, so if your sort of ROE upside in the good times is eight or nine or 10 percent, and you're going to get whacked by a 10, 12 percent ROE decline in the bad times, what you're effectively saying is this is a system which doesn't make very much money in the upside and, and becomes loss making every six, seven, eighth year or whatever the gap is between recessions. And that I think so. So I, I think one of the challenges of the cost of equity is it's quite an I think it's quite an unstable equilibrium that because the ROE is so suppressed on the upside for a variety of reasons, some of which are regulatory driven, many of which are just wider economy driven. But because the ROE is so capped on the upside, it makes banks very unattractive investments or very dangerous investments for equity investors because you know that every seventh year they're going to be losing money and needing more capital. Um, and, and, and one thing I should say, there is an entirely, a, the reason I say it's important to decide what kind of banking system we want, because there is an entirely uh, um, uh, uh, appropriately functioning banking system in Europe, which is by a mile the weakest banking system in Europe, Germany, which is also the banking system of the strongest economy in Europe. So you have in Germany, the worst banks and the strongest economy. And so there is definitely a road map that say now there's a million reasons why the ROE and the profitability for German banks is rubbish because they're not publicly uh, they're not profit maximizing organizations they're Sparkhouse and Landers banks owned by their local governments or by their customers but in a way forget about the reason there is a model there that says you know what banks are there just as a utility to serve the wider economy they don't very make very much money and we can live with that and the economy is fine with that the problem I think we have in the UK is that the overwhelming majority of the UK banking system is privately or is, is publicly quoted and as private shareholders who demand it to be profit maximizing. And I think that's where a lot of these issues clash. And I think the cost of equity is part of the outturn of that clash about a capped ROE on the upside because of utility-like behavior crashing up against a very cyclical industry. Alex, do you want to respond on that? Uh, yeah, a couple of points. And then uh, first on Simon's thing and then on John's, John's points, I, I think, you know, I don't disagree with Simon at all because when you look at the the sort of distribution of ROE over time, it, it's pretty skewed. And you know, arguably, the only thing that was keeping cost of equity down pre-08 was a misplaced, either a misplaced belief in the risks or a belief that they were too big to fail and would receive state bailouts, as indeed some of them did. And so sort of ending too big to fail, which has been one of the crusades of the past you know, 15 years, has actually kind of exposed that underlying issue that Simon's, Simon's describing. Mm -hmm. And when you're a bank investor, you look at that distribution, which has a ginormous downside skew in it, uh, and you price the equity accordingly. Now, on one level, though, it, it gets it goes to John's point, you know, does the, an equity investor can receive the necessary return by buying into the equity at the appropriately low price, which is what the valuation implies uh, right now. So they are, I go back to this point, they are investable. It's just the current shareholders might not like the price that they're investable at. And uh, the link though is to go to John's point is about buffer use is about buffer usability, which is what we need in a downturn from the perspective of the economy uh, and market and equity valuations. And I do think this is the important interaction because while returns are relatively weak and cost of equity relatively high, uh, banks do need to have the confidence that dipping into capital buffers doesn't is, isn't a kind of immediate uh, signing of a piece of paper that says we will now need to issue lots of equity in the future at an incredibly dilutive price uh, in order to get back to where we were. And that's why it's important, really important for us when we're thinking about rebuilds of things like counter-cyclical buffers or 
other parts of the capital buffer stack to take into account banks' ability to, to generate capital organically. Now, on the distributions front, um, you know, difficult, uh, I think, to, to strike this balance between wanting to keep uh, cost of equity as low as possible for that reason, that we need buffers to be usable and we need banks to be investable for that reason. And on the other hand, uh, preserving capital to deal with what may or may not lay, lie ahead. I think we have, you, uh, can't emphasize enough, really important to remember the situation banks were in at that point, or the world was in at that point in March. It was a kind of accident of timing that you know we just entered this, this crisis at the point they were thinking of putting the money out of the door for the 2019 dividend. And at that point, it was a kind of point of maximum uncertainty. And it wasn't until you know May, August that we were really we really felt able to say enough about the outlook to say, okay, the banks can withstand a very, very wide range here of uh, of economic scenarios. Now that's something we'll take into account when we're thinking about banks' dividend plans uh, in the fourth quarter. We know from stress tests and other exercises that they do have the capacity to deal with really quite severe covid related. Uh, scenarios. We didn't know that on March the 19th or whenever it was. So I think it's really important to, to remember what was happening at the time. I do accept the point about the link between, well, dividends on the one hand via valuations to buffer use. And that's why, you know, we need to factor that important link, as I say, into, into decisions down the road about buffers and in the meantime about, about dividends. Jane, your your response to what you've heard. Um, well, I as, um, I wish there was less focus on this return on equity um, metric for banks. Um, it actually served the sector badly before the financial crisis because it gave so many incentives to suppress equity, so the returns look good. Um, so I think it's inevitable, as Alex has said, that one you know, and we're all glad that banks are better capitalised now. Um, actually, if you look at a gross leverage ratio, it's still about twenty to one. So actually, I'm sort of with John, thinking, you know, hang on a minute. Um, if if that some of the low uh, book value uh, share price values are to do with nervousness about asset values. I mean, going forward over the next year or two, as all the negative economic consequences play out, whether it's in the property market or Whatever. So I think there is nervousness about um, still about asset values and eventual losses. And perhaps we're not quite nice to have a little comment on actually how much government guarantees are perhaps mitigating um, that. Um, the, but so the other thing is if you if you stop sort of just obsessing about that ratio, you, let's think, and Alex has alluded to this, about banks helping themselves. Um, actually, misconduct misconduct costs have come down, thank goodness. Uh, there's the PPI um, scandal has uh, finally petered out um, and hopefully this uh, there aren't new ones in the pipeline um, quietly branches are being closed thanks to covid so that's that is helping banks to control their costs um, so that's that's good news and for the banks that are managed that have other income and Barclays was obviously a good example of this um, actually fees the, the fee income looks quite healthy um, and actually maybe they may even get to questioning the you know free if in credit banking model. So I think there's actually quite a lot that banks can do to help themselves um, without sort of weeping over return on equity demands. Can I just ask Alex to respond on that, but particularly on, uh, obviously on the investment banking side, the investment banking side has looked pretty damn good, uh, not just in the UK. Um, is this a route that we really want to push the banks down? Well, uh, to go to Simon's point about relationship between regulator and uh, and banks, not for us to push them down any particular business model route. Uh, I mean, it's not always been the case, 07 being a prime example, where having a diversified business model has actually helped you, because often correlations go to one. But what's interesting uh, in this, uh, in this uh, episode has been, actually ever since March, um, trading activity has performed much better than um, lending activity for the obvious reason that the you know GDP collapsed by twenty percent, uh, and market market volatility isn't necessarily a bad thing for a bank earning uh, fee income and, and trading income. So it has been a source of a, a sort of cushion uh, for some for some institutions. The um, the point about um, conduct is a good one though. I mean, 
it's been an incredible drag on banks' returns, not even not just on equity, but return on assets has been uh, kept very low over a period of you know 10 years now through repeated conduct fines. Uh, Jane mentioned PPI, but there are many others uh, as well. And that just shows the importance for banks of managing conduct risk, because if you don't manage that, it's an incredible drag on returns for very many years. Uh, fortunately, now we're coming to the end of, as Jane said, the kind of fines for the past misconduct. Really important that banks keep a lid on the potential fines they can face uh, for, for future conduct, which has implications for their business model uh, and maybe for short-term efficiency. But you know, investment in that sort of stuff turns out to be really quite valuable in the long run uh, in managing potential downside risk to your earnings later on. Well, I suppose that also brings up another point that Jane raised, which was the efficacy of the government guarantee as a mitigant. I mean, the, the government guarantee of uh, pandemic lending is always dependent on the banks having carried out proper due diligence. And one wonders if this isn't a, a source of contention down the line a little bit. I think um, the you know, government guarantee schemes have been incredibly valuable in this episode. In March, we were in a position where we needed the banking system and, in fact, the wider financial system to help the corporate sector bridge what we calculated could be a cash flow deficit, even after government schemes like furlough, over the order of £200 billion. So it needed a massive expansion in the supply of finance at a time when you know, risk is rising, risk about the outlook is rising. So the government schemes are absolutely essential uh, in that, I think. Now, for C-bills, uh, the business interruption loan schemes, having the 80-20 split, meaning banks have some skin in the game, uh, means that they actually have performed you know, pretty normal checks uh, on those loans. And effectively, they've lent £20 and the government's lent the other 80 or back the other 80. The bounce back loans, obviously, much smaller, much quicker. Uh, and um, we'll see uh, how many companies are able to, to service those very effectively. By the way, I don't think, given the uh, terms of those loans, in terms of fixed interest rate, long term, now extendable, that we will see uh, lots of companies, smaller companies, facing difficulty uh, with the debt servicing of those loans. And in fact, those loans for many of those companies were an absolute lifeline uh, to get through this. No doubt there will be some difficulties. And I know, and you know, see in the press, the Treasury and the banks are working together on how to manage collectively companies that do have trouble uh, servicing down the road. But don't forget, these were an absolutely essential part of managing the initial uh, economic challenge. And the banks have done, I think, overall, a very good job of, draw of using those schemes to, to supply the necessary credit to the economy. John, do you want to come in on that? Because you, you obviously have experience of the, of the Irish situation. Yeah, I think, look, it's been an incredibly important in terms of economic support. Um, I guess it's it's phase one in one respect, in, 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 my, in my view. Um, look, debt isn't going to be the answer for all the enterprises, and I know there have been various press reports about a lot of work um, underway in the background uh, from a policy perspective in terms of how to support businesses potentially with equity injections in time. But I think you know it's been a, a it's been a highly significant response, and you know has has effectively dealt with the problem at hand uh, thus far. You know the the, the banks will face difficulties in terms of the challenge uh, of, uh, from a collections perspective next year. Um, you know, cynics would say it's, you know, they're taking the benefit of the lending, some of which is risk weighted at zero. And in the case of Seabills, 80% of the lending risk weighted at zero. So, you know, and are making income, albeit in some case, again, for a lot of that lending, it's below their, below their, it's, it's nim destructive, but it's still, positive income when one reflects on the risk weights attached to it so it should therefore be responsible for collections on the other hand I think look from a bandwidth perspective you know it's going to be incredibly challenging for the banks to continue to focus on lending to the real economy if they're subsumed by that there were there were a couple of other points I'd like to just come back on for for a moment um Jane's point on ROE and also Alex's point on on dividends and Maybe taking the second one first, I, I absolutely recognise that there were highly significant question marks in March around the severity and duration of this crisis. Um, you know, the Bank of England hadn't done its own, finalised its own work in terms of ascertaining the expected loan loss impacts and, and other 
uh, headwinds for the sector accruing from this crisis. Um, you know, what, what, what's really important to me is to understand, and I think, you know, investors may, may, may get this in Q4 when the Bank of England does uh, set out its thinking from a dividend perspective at that point. But to the extent that that's a one-off intervention at a time of unprecedented uncertainty, I think, you know, the I don't want to say the door can be closed on it, but I think that's 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 something that investors can you know take account of and take some comfort with to the extent that now we're in a slightly more clear position with respect to capital strength and outlook, you know, and the banks get to decide for themselves, I guess. We'll, we'll see what comes in Q4, but I think that would be very, very helpful. Uh, and I think the the so just to re reiterate again on, on dipping into capital buffers and not forcing banks into emergency rights issues or whatnot, I think it's eminently sensible. Um, to come back on, on Jane's point on ROE, I think it's a really important point and relates back to Simon's initial comment around what kind of a banking system do we want. In very simplistic terms, and I think that I'd be very interested in the, in, in the audience, in, in people's views on this, you know, in a very simple world, you know, there are two ways to, to, to deal with the problem that banks have in terms of investability. One is to go with the proposals of the likes of Anad Admati to push up capital requirements ever further, compressing ROE in the process, but thereby banks become utilities with perhaps more stable return profiles. Investors don't demand a 10% return or a 13% return on their investment and, and are quite comfortable that banks can continue to to, to to pay out dividends and to 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 return capital to shareholders, um, albeit their their profitability is 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 is, is much less. Um, on, on the other hand, I'm not, I'm not convinced that would provide the fix that we that that, that the theory suggests it would, um, which is also related to the point around how banks trade depending on degree of leverage. Um, the, the other way would be more support for uh, minimum returns. Um, you know, for example, the TFSME and other support measures have been highly constructive, but more could be done to stimulate mortgage lending looking forward. Not a problem right now, of course, given the pent-up demand and the significant activity in that particular space. But to the extent that, you know, lending becomes a, an issue in certain sub-segments of the market, well, then we could see supportive interventions um, that, that would help the sector and would help the sector generate returns. Um, similarly, if negative rates were imposed, you know, some form of tiering would be would be a useful offset. Um, notably, the Swiss haven't gone further than the ECB in that respect. So, just some, you know, just some points there. I think that I'd be, I'd be interested in people's views on. Alex, those are really fairly fundamental points. Do you yes. have a yeah, yes, they are. Uh, just to uh, come on some of them. So firstly, on the point about return on equity, uh, com completely take that. I mean, I think some of the focus on return on equity comes about because of the point Simon started with, actually, and John's picked up, which is the kind of stickiness of cost of equity. So one is led down the track of thinking, if only I could just increase leverage and re increase the return on equity, uh, I can thereby increase it relative to my sticky uh, cost of equity. Um, and it is true that cost of equity does seem to be a little bit sticky in, in all directions, which is why the, you know, the analysis we've done over the years on what's the kind of optimal level of capital for banks. Is it you know, 30 percent? Uh, actually, that's very costly because you end up uh, because the so-called Midigliani Miller theorem does not hold uh, in full. Um, you know, textbook doesn't apply to the real world 100 percent. So we, you know, we think capital levels around about where they are, you know, well, well north, as Simon said, of where they were in 07, but well below some of the, um, the proposals that, that are out there that are, are appropriate. And as I said, they give us, pretty, you know, pretty serious levels of resilience um, of the banking system to really quite severe economic shocks already. Um, I hear the point from John about um, things like TFSME. Um, not much more to add to those, really. I think... They are, they are particular. We, we always knew things like TFS were really important um, when the yield curve was falling. And originally, you know, years ago, TFS, uh, as originally designed, was designed to make sure that um, falling short term interest rates with kind of fixed deposit rates at the lower bound didn't result in banks needing to compress net interest margins and, at the, and thereby um, reduce returns and cut back on lending, because that would have been a kind of counterproductive uh, result of a monetary policy loosening. So TFS was designed to enable the, 
transmission of monetary policy rather than offset it. And that's why, you know, that logic extends uh, to any movement in interest rates when you're close to the lower bound. How can you make sure that you don't have unintended effects on credit supply and financial conditions uh, more broadly? And we all take those uh, very seriously and take them into account when thinking about all sorts of macro actions, uh, including um, negative interest rates, as John alludes to. But it's a, it's a kind of extension of the thing we've already been doing as interest rates have approached the lower bound. Yeah. Simon, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. I'd yeah. very much like to hear Simon's view on collections uh, going forward. Yeah, I think, I think, I think um, it was interesting hearing both John and Alex talk. It was slightly reminding me of, um, I mean, first of all, I think that sort of Medigliano Miller concept, um, you know, one of the things I always think about the banking system is, you know, where does, you know, where does banks get their debt from? And, and we sort of think in our minds, wholesale funding, but actually the overwhelming majority of debt comes from customer depositors. And, you know, one of the things that's happened uh, since the end of the, since the last financial crisis has been an explosion in deposit guarantee schemes, which has effectively meant a great swathe of debt holders in banks don't care about the healthiness of the bank. They don't have to care. It's guaranteed. If you're below whatever we are at 85,000 pounds in the UK, it's 85, I think it is. Um, yeah. if, you're, if you're below the deposit guarantee scheme, you don't care. You just go for the highest interest rate. You know, no, no bank ever sends a letter to its depositors saying, look how strong our capital ratios are. People don't care. And I think one of the interesting things, and it slightly links into the dividend thing, you know, if you go back to 2007, when the UK deposit guarantee scheme was £3,000, £3,000 was the scheme, the UK go uh, governor of the Bank of England at the time stood up and said, all depositors in Northern Rock are guaranteed by the government. And the treasurer and the chancellor at the time said exactly the same. And I think people remember these things. And you know, the government policy and actions have a, a, an afterlife that's very, very long. And you know, I think depositors today are broadly indifferent on the health of the bank they're leaving money with because they know that everybody got bailed out in 2007, 2008. And I think that same afterlife memory will also affect this dividend decision as well. That Okay, we understand that you know the rules are if there's a once in a hundred year pandemic, dividends get stopped. And please God, we're not going to have another one of these pandemics for another hundred years. So in a way, we can forget about that risk. But what about if it's a, you know, that there's a, an unfortunate coincidence of timing that another set of dividend payments come out just before there's you know some terrible terrorist event or a nuclear attack or a war somewhere, you know, something that some huge economic dislocation. Will the regulation in the UK and, and in Europe again play the, the dividend stop joker? So I think I think these these policy responses have an afterlife that that that's decades actually, not not sort of just near term. So I totally get and look, I know Alex, you're not appropriate appropriate, you're clearly not going to comment, but let's re you know, if we fast forward this conversation today to, to a year's time, I think we'd all be working the assumption that banks are back again paying dividends. I don't think that's the end of the problem. I think there's a memory to what's happened here uh, about the way the regulators, to, to use John's language, didn't just let the banks be adults and Jews. They said, you know, you kids and we're, we're in charge here and this is what you have to do. And I think there's a memory that investors will have on that going forward. Let me ask uh, Alex one, one thing that hasn't come up at all. We've talked about this strictly in the domestic context. In the time of the great financial crisis, we were much more concerned about international cooperation, the international financial architecture. Uh, is the international financial architecture irrelevant for these particular problems? Is it, in fact, fit for purpose at this particular time for these, these kinds of pandemic-related crises? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think it, it is largely fit for purpose in terms of the post the post uh, financial crisis reforms, but with an important exception, uh, which we'll need looking at after this, and that's the. Uh, it goes back to this question of buffer usability. You know, we have to make sure, learning the lessons from whatever happens here, that the capital framework we've got to go to um, the you know my prudence with a purpose thing is is prudent, but also with the purpose of serving the economy. There's no point having loads of capital in banks that can't be drawn down to absorb losses and keep lending uh, in a stress. So it may turn out that changes, tweaks, amendments need to be made to the design of the capital framework to learn the lessons uh, from this. But broadly speaking, the post-crisis kind of banking reforms, I think, have served us very well. As I say, we would have been in the banking crisis uh, by now. Uh, and, you know, they've been pretty uniform across um, 
uh, across jurisdictions. The one area, and we may not want to get into this, but the one area where I think this crisis gives us lessons of an, on a need for a new post-crisis reform agenda isn't around banks at all, actually. It's around um, liquidity of important markets and the behavior of a lot of non-bank players. You look back to March, and you know the banking system was a source of strength at that point, but very many important markets, including the US Treasury market and the gilt market, actually uh, experienced a period of dysfunction, be not because of any concern about the underlying asset, but because many of the players in those markets were under severe pressure and need to generate cash very quickly, perhaps to meet margin call or, le or deleverage. Uh, and as a result, that had a macro consequence. And the answer was very large scale asset purchases by a very large number of central banks. And there are serious questions, I think, that the Financial Stability Board is now uh, addressing uh, on you know, what reforms do we need in that area uh, so that we're better prepared across the financial system which partly due to the reforms post GFC has become less bank centric. Uh, so we need the rest of the system to be uh, isn't in a different way, but to be as safe for the economy as the banking system has been. Okay, Jane, um, your takeaways from this, the final word I feel should be with you because after all, this was very much something that you put together. Um, well, um, lots Lots of fascinating comments, obviously. I think um, the, the first thing to say is that I think, and I quite like Simon's um, sort of uh, memory, group memory thing, and I think there is um, a, a, a concern about political interference or regulatory prescriptiveness, parent-child um, approach to the banks, that investors do think, well, you know, are banks really allowed to make proper commercial decisions uh, to put our interests anywhere near first? when actually they're vehicles for public policy. And I think that hasn't quite settled down yet. I mean, there, could, there can be an upside to that, as uh, some of the comments about banks as utilities have borne out. Um, but, but leaving that on one side, thinking it, uh, just about them, other aspects of investability, um, somebody told me a long time ago that um, investment in banks was uh, a, a macroeconomic play. So it's basically um, not surprising that the values are low when we're still uh, in recession, and we're not sure whether it's going to be a W. We've given a properly given up on a V, and maybe the Bank of England hasn't actually. Is it going to be a W, you know, a, a bath, or even an L shape? So I think that you know there's a sort of classic economic concerns um, reflected here. Um, I think if banks can do some of the things that are being talked about in terms of whether it's cost control um, or actually being uh, some, some sort of some of the more cost control conduct, you know, good behavior, and actually making more of the way that they're helping to the, the real economy. Um, they will be good recovery plays, maybe from next year, but you need to be able to see your way out of the recession for that. And of course, it would be nice if they were not just recovery stocks, but yield and recovery stocks. Um, and so I think actually the resumption of dividends will be very important to that. Okay, on that optimistic note, can I thank all of you, Alex, Simon and uh, John, and of course my colleague Jane, and all of you for watching. Many, many thanks to all of you.